Hey there, it's Dr. Trussell, and um, I want to briefly go through a summary of Chapter 2 of the Giancola textbook, um, which gives a history of evaluation. Most of this stuff you should be able to just read through in the book. Um, there's lots of examples and details and things, so I really will um, gloss over a lot, a lot of the details here um, because there's not there's not a lot that's especially thick or or hard to comprehend from the book in this chapter. So um, I'll leave it to you to do do that reading. Um, but the the chapter starts with an evolution of the field of evaluation, um, which of course is used to determine the value of something or worth of something. Um, it's not really a perfect process and it's been evolving really since the beginning of time. <laughs> this textbook, this chapter starts uh, with a discussion even of um, Adam and Eve um, and then of uh, the thought that even through the evolutionary processes um, there in, in studying genes, survivability, um, there is some element of evaluation in um, physical evolution, right? Um, certainly in the story of Adam and Eve um, from the Bible, um, we see Eve evaluating the information she has and choosing whether to um, partake of the forbidden fruit or not. Um, but then from a more scientific standpoint, um, we also see this evaluation of uh, the, the usefulness of a gene um, in whether it survives throughout evolution or not. So evaluation's been around sort of informally really forever, um, but then starts to really formalize itself um, during the 1800s, right? So um, we start to see some human evaluation of systems or of employees, that sort of stuff, um, way back in uh, China in 2200 BCE. Um, but then in the 1800s, we start to see evaluation um, using grades in education um, and other, um, in other contexts as well. We start to see evaluation sort of develop as a thing that people do to try to make things um, more measurable um, in terms of measuring outcomes. But then as evaluation continues to evolve, we start to not only measure outcomes, but use those uh, to, to improve processes. Um, early to middle 20th century, um, we start to see scientific management come into to play where in business and nonprofit, um, we start to look at um, sort of a scientific way, a, a statistical analysis of processes and how to improve them. Um, and we start to see uh, things like this comprehensive um, long-term um, evaluation that happens in the field of education in Chicago um, from 1932 to 1940. Um, the guy named Ralph Tyler um, uh, decides to, to study across 30 different schools, um, looks at the effectiveness of different curricula. Um, really, really leads to a real um, uh, sort of development in the field of evaluation and how we do evaluation over long-term um, uh, programs. Um, and that leads to the development of the NAEP, which is the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which is um, still around today. Um, because of that, um, uh, first sort of long-term evaluation, um, Tyler is known as the father of evaluation, but even, um, after Tyler's, uh, efforts, um, early in the 1900s, um, what really, really led to, uh, the field of evaluation developing into sort of what we know today as as really a, something that's 
um, that permeates um, all of business and nonprofit and government work um, happened when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik, the first satellite to orbit the Earth, um, which led us to fund NASA um, and started the U.S. down a path of really evaluating our education processes um, to try to figure out why the Soviet Union was ahead of us in the space race and how to keep that from happening again. Um, and then we sort of continue after that in a trajectory of, of becoming a, a society, a government that does more evaluating of things. Um, through the 1960s, when we launch a lot of social programs, we start to evaluate them um, as part built into part of the, the programs when they're established. Um, in the late 20th century, early 21st century, um, we um, start to see even more um, evaluation, calls to evaluate uh, social programs and evaluate education. Um, we start to need professionals with evaluation skills. Um, and so that's when um, evaluation starts to become a professional or a uh, field or a place where folks can find jobs. Um, people become professional evaluators as a result really of, of Sputnik's launch and, and the things that that spurred in terms of our evaluating um, our programs, education and other um, social programs. Um, I guess I should say the textbook offers an interesting list of professors who have been um, or, or professionals in different fields from across uh, psychology um, and sociology and different, all sorts of different fields um, who are instrumental in developing the field of evaluation. Um, in the late 20th century, early 21st century, we start to see university courses in how to evaluate, um, like this one, uh, pop up. Um, we have the creation of the American Evaluation Association, which is a group of evaluation professionals who are um, focused on sharing their knowledge of evaluation approaches and methods. Um, it now has about 7,300 members across 80 countries. Um, so lots of these folks in this field of work. Um, and we start to see um, increased funding for policy evaluation as it becomes recognized as a more and more important part of formulating policy and formulating programs that work well. Um, so this chapter starts with that sort of look across time at um, how evaluation has evolved and then gives another way of looking at this. So um, uh, a uh, researcher called named Hogan um, describes the evolution of evaluation in sort of chunks of time, um, periods of of evaluation development. I'll let you read more about these, but they are the age of reform, the age of efficiency and testing, the Tylerian age, the age of innocence, age of development, age of professionalization, and age of expansion and integration. And these are just ways of categorizing those different um, leaps in evaluation um, that we looked at in that timeline that starts this chapter. We then move to look at um, ethics in evaluation. Um, of course, we use evaluation with good intentions in order to um, increase knowledge, to share knowledge, to make things better. But in many cases in, in the past, um, and sometimes currently, um, this has created harm to the people who have been part of um, evaluating different programs or um, different sciences. And so we needed an establishment of ethical guidelines. Um, and we'll go more into those ethical guidelines in future chapters. But this chapter takes us through some of those um, instances of harm as a result of evaluation. Um, many of them are somewhat famous. So 
um, the Nazi Germany experiments, Japanese Unit 731, which was very similar to the Nazi Germany experiments, um, the Soviet chamber, um, the aversion project in uh, South Africa. Um, these are all instances where human beings were um, subjects of um, scientific testing, it, for lack of a better word, um, who were experimented on um, using poisons or surgeries, things like that, um, without real regard for human um, feelings or um, psychology, psychological effects as well. So the Aversion Project specifically um, had to do with uh, South Africa's attempt to convert homosexuals to heterosexuals. Um, and so that was sort of uh, without regard to psychological effects or long-term effects of these projects. So we know um, those of us who were raised and educated in the U.S., we learned about several of these experiments, um, these sort of horrific uh, events in other countries, but it's important that we don't overlook the fact that the U.S. has been involved in these sorts of experiments as well um, that are unethically or at best ethically questionable. Um, so human experiments in the U.S. or by the U.S., the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, um, where uh, African-American um, individuals were, were denied treatment um, for syphilis, even after we knew that penicillin could treat syphilis. Um, the monster study, um, where uh, Dr. Johnson in the, in the 1930s um, studied children and um, even those who did not have a, have a speech impediment, he told them that they did and watched the effects. And we um, saw that they developed speech impediments just having been um, diagnosed with them. Um, U.S. radiation experiments where individuals were exposed to radiation at um, really high levels uh, Guatemala syphilis experiments, which is where um, it actually was uncovered that the U.S. was doing similar syphilis experiments to the Tuskegee syphilis experiments, but in Guatemala, um, where uh, many folks, up to 80 um, individuals, died um, for participating in that study. Um, Project MKUltra, uh, CIA mind control experiments during the Cold War. Um, Participants were given hallucinogenic drugs, hypnosis, things like that, um, to modify behavior and study um, study how those things worked. A lot of them didn't even know they were um, they were involved in the experiment. So ethically, um, clearly, some uh, some question marks there. Um, Holmesburg prison experiments, where in the 1950s. Um, Prisoners were paid to be part of uh, medical experiments where they were infected with different um, uh, diseases or drugs or chemicals um, and then observed um, it through those experiments. So these are all, um, and then more, um, you can read about these other ones as well. I won't, I won't go through all of them, but these are all examples of times when the U.S. was involved in um, experimentation, sort of in the name of evaluation, but experimentation that was ethically um, questionable at best and many times just flat out unethical. Um, still today, we're dealing with these sorts of questions in, um, in research, gene editing of human embryos, um, one example of, of an ethical question that is still sort of outstanding. And do, should we do this? To what extent should we do this? When is it okay? When is it not okay? Um, uh, so then there are these um, common threads in issues in evaluation that still come up today in um, discussions of evaluation. How do we do evaluation? Concern number one being how do evaluators construct knowledge about programs? So um, this speaks to how we conduct evaluation, uh, what we can and cannot measure, approaches and designs we use. Um, concern two, theoretical frameworks and practical methods. So 
how do evaluators place value on evaluation results? Um, how much weight do these evaluations carry? And um, how much should we allow them or how do we allow them in, to inform recommendations? Concern three, how do programs change and how can evaluation be used to influence that change? Um, this is a major difference between primary research and evaluation. Evaluation is targeted toward improving a particular uh, program as opposed to research, which may just be to increase our knowledge about something. Um, so the usefulness and use of evaluation findings are necessary for change to occur and for programs to um, become more effective. Concern four, how do evaluators use evaluation results to influence policy making? Um, a lot like concern three, um, but instead re uh, relates to leveraging evaluation results to influence policy process, not just how do we change our pro our programs, but how do we um, use our findings to change policy, um, sort of on a larger scale. Concern five, how can evaluators organize their practice to address concerns one through four? Um, so how do we make sure that when we design our evaluation methods, um, that we are designing them in a way where results can be communicated and used for program improvement um, as we, uh, and, and sort of justify the evaluation that we're doing? How much will this evaluation results um, influence policy processes? The last part of this chapter just um, introduces readers to some ways in which evaluation resources are shared. Um, so we've got uh, the Cochrane collaboration, the What Works Clearinghouse, which is a, a, for education um, specifically, um, American Evaluation Association. These are all organizations or collaborations that exist to um, disseminate, to share evaluation resources. Um, so what has been done, what has been evaluated before, um, and what's out there. These are places where we can uh, uh, put things, um, previous evaluations for use by um, any individuals who are interested or trying to improve their programs or processes. Um, so an example given in your book, you can look at this figure 2.1 shows how the WWC, um, which is the What Works Clearinghouse for Education um, Evaluation, how they evaluate um, different studies um, and how they, uh, how they catalog, catalog them for other individuals to be able to use. That is chapter two. I know that's a lot, um, and it really just scratches the surface. Um, I really encourage you, like I said, to go back and read through this chapter because there are um, lots of examples and historical context um, here to this history of evaluation. Um, that's really just interesting and important for us to understand as we move into how evaluation is done today. Um, it's important to sort of know what's been done in the past and what um, mistakes we're trying to avoid in terms of ethical issues as we move forward into um, our present day evaluation efforts.